Cool. So today, um, I'm talking about a topic which is really close to my heart. It's uh, this idea of change. And I'm not sure if we're at the very start. So here, changing perspective. I'll, I'll just start with another quick word of prayer, if that's all right with you guys. Father God, just come before you now. I just ask that this, these words might be yours. Amen. Today, I want to ask the question, how do we have maximum value? Here you are, Saturday afternoon, weekend, you're all tired. Why are you here? How can this, how could these 20 minutes be significant in your life? How can you get the most value out of the time that you're spending here for the next 20 or so minutes? Because I want to post postulate that the next 20 minutes could change your life. I'm going to start off by looking at the question, what makes someone great? More broadly, when, when we think greatness, what sort of people, what, what names come to mind? Shout out some great people who you, who you think of. Shane, what do you reckon? Einstein. Mandela. Nelson Mandela, definitely. I think Isaac Newton, I think. Rachel, you got someone? Gandhi, for sure, for sure. What, someone's, what makes someone great is sort of this, this idea. We all want to know how can we be great? How can we live significant lives? How can we live abundant lives? How can we ensure that our lives mean something in the world? So I want to just do have a bit of fun and look at some advertising media campaigns and see how ads often define greatness. Demons. First ad is by the misfits, Apple. The rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. I wasn't around when this ad came out, obviously. I think it's back in like 80s or 90s or something, but, but I find that the final line by, by Jobs, they're powerful. The people who think they are crazy enough to change the world are the ones who do. From this ad, we see that to be great means to think differently, to believe that you can make a difference. Think different. How many of you have seen this ad? Um, actually, this is an ad for... Guess Surely what do you think this ad's about? Beyond all expectations. A testament to modernity. Breathtaking. You guys worked it out yet? A commanding presence above all. Where a wealth of indulgence awaits. And the ultimate experiences take center stage. Discover the power of play. Feel the connection. Share the excitement and give it your all. Marina Bay Sands, Singapore. Never settle. Uh, it, I'm, I'm studying arts and in that I'm doing a bit of psychology and I got to have a lot of fun reading lots of journal articles about how the media pair, uses classical conditioning to pair an object with something else. And here I love this brilliant bit of marketing where they've paired David Beckham is this great superhero, superstar, this great football or soccer player. And they paired him with Marina Bay Sands, Singapore. What's great about David Beckham? Sorry? <laughs> what, according to this ad, what makes David Beckham great? David Beckham never settled for, he was, oh sorry, what were you going to say? He's a soccer player, yeah, I guess that makes him great enough in his own right. David Beckham 
um, never settles according to the SAD. And likewise, Marina Bay Sands Singapore never settle for the status quo. They always want more. They always want to improve. They always want to up the standard. Let's have a look at another ad. Um, how many of you guys have been on e Link this between Ferntree Gully Road and High Street Road. There's an ad that says, new problems are solved by new thinking. To be great means to think in a new way. There's another ad if some of you guys have been on North Road, Wellington Road. When we think we know it all, we think again. To be great means to be willing to think again. I've got some quotes here by George Lucas. He says, I put the force into the movies. If you're familiar with Star Wars, the force. I put the force into the movies in order to try and awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. More a belief in God than a belief in any particular religious system. And he goes on to say in this interview, the real question is to ask the question. If you haven't enough interest to ask the questions of the meaning of life, then that's for me the worst thing that can happen. According to George Lucas, to be great, to pursue greatness, to pursue, to pursue an abundant life means to be willing to ask questions. <laughs> As a child, I dreamed. But I stopped dreaming. And I started doing. Because it's the power of doing that makes dreams happen. What makes Usain Bolt great? Can anyone, can anyone do that, that Jamaican accent perfectly? It's the power of doing that makes dreams happen. I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I wish I could. Can, can I, uh, anyway, anyway, so, so um, Usain Bolt is someone who is stopping nothing for more. He always wants to pursue more, and as a result, he's the fastest man on earth. To be great means to stop at nothing. To, to dream and then to do. So I've got here at the top, stop and nothing. If we to sum this all up in one word, I like to say that what makes someone great is someone who is willing to change. Someone who is not satisfied with their current state of being. Someone who always wants more in every facet of their life. Always, want to be, always wanting to be fitter to be healthier, to be more um, in relation, more, more connected, to be more spiritual, always wanting to change and always wanting more. This guy um, who's very inspiring is called Dean Karnazes. And he got famous because a few years ago, he decided to do a marathon. But more than any normal marathon, he decided to do 50 marathons. And he did these 50 marathons in 50 consecutive days. He ran a marathon a day in every single state of America for 50 days. I think he started off on the, east, on the west coast, finished off in New York, and then th thought at the end of it, oh, you know what, I'll just run home. <laughs> this, guy, this guy is crazy. And he's got, a, he's got a little quote here, which I've actually made my desktop background on, on my computer for the last few months to try to, try to motivate me to study, because that's always an issue for me. <laughs> He says, run, it, run when you can. Walk if you have to. Crawl if you must. Just never give up. This guy is great because he will stop at nothing for more. He never gives up. He's always willing to think different, to ask questions, to pursue more. So I want to ask the question, how does this apply if we're following Jesus? How, could, how does this principle of greatness, of searching, of always striving for more, apply if we want to follow Jesus? Just to clarify, here's a couple of awesome, awesome verses in John. Jesus essentially gives his mission statement for life, and he says that there's a thief 
the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. There's a thief that's coming, trying to take away our lives. But I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. I love Eugene Peterson renders it in the message, I came that they can have a real and eternal life, more and better than they ever dreamed of. This is a verse which I really want to hone in on to today. Uh, it's found in Matthew 7, which is one of the great ex- extrapolate, one of the parts of the Sermon on the Mount. And here in the New Living's translation, it says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. To be great, to live an abundant life, we need to be willing to ask questions seek for more, keep knocking, leap on opportunities, and then and only then can great things happen. Can God use us in amazing ways? We're called to be willing to change. I ask the question, why do people come to church? We all might have our various, various reasons for, for being here or for being at another service or pretending any community for that matter. But in general, why do people go to church? What do you reckon, Shane? Fellowship. Fellowship. See friends? For sure. Belonging. Belonging. Sense of community, sense of connection. For sure. Rory, do you have anything? I, I sort of summed up in three points. I think some of the big reasons people go to church are um, because they always have. It's a sort of a tradition. You grow up in church and you go on and then you want your family, you want your, um, your kids to be raised in church as well. So it's, you go to church because you always have. See friends, I think community, fellowship, that's a big component as to why people do go to church. Um, next point, feel good. Often, often when I'm really down after a long week, I really enjoy church as a place where I can feel good, a place where I can come together, be, I guess, energized from the energy from the other people that are there. But then I got thinking, like, all right, let's ask the question, why do people go to therapy? Why do people go to therapy? A few, um, started this year, I was, or actually for years, I've been, sort of had like chronic headaches, and so I, kind of going into uni, I was like, all right, I really want to put an end to this, because it's really hard to study or do anything when you've just got a you know, headache going on. And so, um, so I made a few appointments to see see a professional and um, and that went on for a few months and at the end of it he said look Daniel we're not going to make any more appointments because you're healed you're better because you have changed and so to think that people go to therapy because they always have sounds completely ridiculous no one wants to be a therapy you're there because there's something wrong with you see friends well that's really sad if you have to go to therapy to see friends and feel good, you're not going to feel good at the therapy because there are people are telling you you've got to do this in your life, Daniel, you've got to improve your posture there, you've got to change and start sleeping more, you've got to change your life. It makes no sense because the reason that people go to therapy is to change. And so I want to ask the question, what if the reason that we went to church was to change? What if this was the only community place where we felt comfortable sharing that life's troubles, life's troubles? What if this was the only intimate space where we could feel that we, um, we had a true sense of meaning and purpose in life? What if this was the space that we, we, where we could come together, come together and, I guess, see ourselves for who we truly are? The biggest, single biggest criticism against church is hypocrisy. It's the biggest, biggest statistical reason as to why people leave the church. And I'd like to suggest that one reason might be because we spend too much time asking, what have you been reading? Not in, and not enough time asking, what have you been applying? How has the gospel been changing you? How has the word been changing you? How have you been improving your life? striving to be a greater follower of Jesus, striving to be a more kind, loving person, striving to be a light in this world. 
got a quote here by this guy Jason Jaggard who I've borrowed some ideas from for this presentation. And he says, church is not a castle to protect us from society. Church is a movement to change society. What if we started a movement here today? I want to go back to the Sermon on the Mount. We touched on it slightly before. This is this, the first entry of Jesus going into his ministry here on earth. So uh, Luke tells us that he was about 30 years old. Before then, what did Jesus do? Jesus started off as a baby. He grew up and he spent the majority of his life, you know, he only lived on earth for about 33, 34 years, he spent the majority of his life in the carpenter's shed, working. Working there with his father as a chippy. And when we look at, when we look at that, um, it's interesting to see that something clearly happened to Jesus when he was about 12 years old. He went up uh, in the festival to Jerusalem, and there he saw the sacrificial service around the Jewish temple. And something clicked. Something clicked in his mind, and he realized that that lamb is me. That sacrifice. All these symbols for thousands and thousands of years are all pointing to me. Something clicked in that instant, and from 12 years of age, up to 30 years of age before he entered the ministry for 17 or so years. He's there working, he's there soaring, he's there measuring, he's there cutting. But on his mind is ticking over, how am I going to do this? How am I going to come into this world and, and balance this fine line and come across and accurately represent God? How am I going to do this? And so for eight, 17, 18 or so years, he's there working the shed, preparing, thinking, thinking, how am I going to enter? How am I going to, to change the world? And so we come to Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, there Jesus gets up. People come gather around to him from all places. There's whisperings. This guy changed water into wine. There's whisperings. This guy has been doing miracles. This guy has been speaking. And so people come and gather around on this mountain, overlooking, uh, overlooking the water and there. Jesus says six words that would change the world. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Said another way, blessed, you'll be happy, happy if you recognize your spiritual poverty. You'll be happy if you recognize your need for more. You will be happy if you want to change. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit. And so, this guy, Jason Jaggard, uh, I guess was convicted on this idea of change, and so recently he just popped out a book, which I was meant to show, it's in my bag, uh, called Spark Good. And there's just a little two minute video on the side of which he had an idea on how to actively change the world, how to actively um, make a difference in our churches, in our communities, in our worlds. So I just want to play this quick two-minute clip for you guys. Good exists inside of all of us. The scriptures say that God has embedded beauty and strength into our souls. Yet oftentimes it can be a struggle to get what's inside out and into the world around us. It can be our tendency to drift into routine. Routines with our family, with our friends and our work, even our faith. In those routines, good can remain buried and that light that is our lives can begin to grow dim. It's in those moments that what we need is a spark, a flash of light that can reignite our souls. You see, a spark is a choice. It's a risk that people take to step outside of their routine and to do something that takes them closer to becoming who they long to be. I want to invite you into that same conversation to ask the question, what would it look like for you to spark your life? It's a conversation about taking risks, not simply to get what we want, but to want what is good. It's a conversation ultimately about partnering with God to transform our world. One small risk at a time. It's my friend.
first part was actually watching the sunrise. I wrote my mom a poem. To, start up here. to tell my brother that I loved him. I performed at my school's open mic night. Started, uh, be, submit a poem that I wrote to a journal. On a marathon. Calling my grandma. She's pretty much my hero in my life. In his book, one of, the, one of the big lines that really stood out to me was this thing he said, 100% of the life that you want exists outside of your comfort zone. 100% of the life that you want exists outside of your comfort zone. To change our lives takes risk. It, takes, it means taking extraordinary risks, but they can be and should be small first steps, small risks, one step at a time. And his challenge through the idea of Spark Group is that people come together and ask the question, what's one risk that you can take this week to make you a better person or the world a better place? What's one risk that you can take this week to make you a better person or the world a better place? And so I heard this talk presented by this guy um, up in the Gold Coast about last October. Um, and then. I was asked by some, some uh, friends for, from my church out in the suburbs. I'm out in this church called Mazdaq in Forest Hill. And there I said, Daniel, we'd like you to do a three-part series. And I thought, OK, okay sound, sounds all right. Um, I locked it in. And then only after uni started, did I realized it was right in the middle of my exam period. Uh, but that was OK, because this was like a great outlet from study. Um, and, and I was calculating. I was like, all right, I heard this talk last October. Now it's. May, now it's June. I heard this talk, what if the reason we came to church was to change? And I was like, how much have I actually changed in the past six months? Here I am each week, week after week, I've been attending a church. Have I been making myself a better person? Have I been making the world a better place? And so for the month before I talked, I decided to start actively praying, actively listening and thinking, all right, what can I do, God? What are you telling me today? that can change my life and change my world. And so the first week, uh, when, I, when I was conscious about this, praying about this, there was a talk on prophecy, and it just really brought me back to the scriptures as to how important and how amazing the Bible is that 30% of it is predictions of the future. And so I spent that week deep into prophecy. The week after that, there was a talk um, uh, by, an, by an old sort of uncle of mine. And, and there was this quote that stood out in his line, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And I was like, God, what does this mean? And he brought clarity through this quote as to essentially the mission for me for my next six months and my next window of life. I've been juggling where, I guess I've been stretched thin like Vegemite, and I've been trying to think, where can I hone in on? Where can I zoom in on? And, and God really spoke to me and said, look, from this quote, look, just do for one person what you wish you could do for everyone. And then the following week, there was a sermon at my church by this, um, uh, by one of my friend's dads on compassion, talking about Jesus and how Jesus, when he saw people homeless on the street, when he saw people in need, he'd stop down and he'd help them. That night, um, I was going to the footy with a few friends, and I arrived in the city a bit early, and I was walking along, and for the first time, I was just shocked at how many homeless people there are here in the city of Melbourne. Even just walking here to church today, past at least 10 or so. And so I was, I was there walking on by, and I was like, OK, here I am, God. I want to apply what I've learned today. <laughs> here we talked, I spent today at church getting talked about, uh, getting told how Jesus actively helped those in need, how Jesus showed compassion for those in need. And I, was, I just got the thought, like, Daniel, go and stop and talk to them. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm totally fine talking about doing good things. But when it comes to doing them, there was this resistance in me. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want to do that. So I kept walking on. And I saw another guy, and I was like, no, nah, no. Nah. So I kept going. And then I was like, all right, God, if I see one more person, I'll go and do it. And then I decided to do a Jonah. And I saw a tree, and I was like, you know what? I think now's a perfect time to have a nap. So I went down and lay on the tree for 20 minutes, because surely, I mean, I can't pass anyone who's homeless if I'm sitting by myself on a tree. So I sat down, had a bit of a nap, 
And then I was like, all right, I've got to keep going. So I kept walking. Went around the corner up onto Princess Bridge, and there was a guy right there. I was like, okay. So I went, to, I went down, I was like, hey, Glenn, how you? Oh, hey, mate, how are you going? And she was like, yeah, okay. I was like, have you had much to eat today? And he was like, no, I haven't eaten anything today. I was like, all right, um, I'm going to grab dinner now. Do you, want, do you want me to grab you a burger? And he was like, yeah, that would be awesome. And so, so I walked up to Lord of the Fries, grabbed two burgers, um, and then while I was waiting for them to order, I had to, I had to run into a, another shop. And as I was walking by, there was this table. And on the table, there were like Bibles, and there were like steps to Jesus, and paths to peace, and all these really cool books. And I was like, oh, wow. So on my way back, I was like, hey, mate, do you mind if I grab a paths to peace? And the guy was like, yeah, sure, I'll take it. So I took it, went, picked up the burgers, went and sat down with this guy called Glenn, and I got to hear a bit of his story. And I was like, here's your burger. And he just like woofed it down, two or three bites. And I, and I was like, all right, God, what do you want me to do now? Here I am, sitting on the side of the road. I'm freezing. This guy, Glenn. And so I was like, um, hey, Glenn, how, um, are you sleeping on the streets? Or have you got a shelter or something? And he's like, oh, it all depends whether I get enough money to pay for backpackers. And I was like, OK, God, what do I do? And normally, I'm pretty, I don't know. I, normally, I don't carry much with me. Whenever I go anywhere, I've got my phone in one pocket and my wallet in, the, in another. But this one particular day, it was cold, so I brought not one, but two jumpers. So I was like, all right, God, what do I do? And this, this verse came into my mind where all the people going to John and saying, John, what should we do? And John says, repent, and you who has two coats, give one to those in need. I was like, God, no, I don't want to do that. This is like my favorite jumper. This is, this, I've got so much history, like I can still remember back to the day when when I, I had my guinea pig and like we kept him in the jumper, like I was like, no God, this this jumper has served me so well. I did not want to change. I did not not want to apply what I've been talking about and listening about for years and weeks and months and months and months. And so I was like, God, no, I don't want to do that. And then then and then I thought again. I was like, all right, all right. So I was like, hey Glenn, this this is a really warm jumper. It, that, that weekend was just a bit like coming through a real cold snap, and I was like, look, man, take this. This has served me well for a long time. I'm sure this will really help you out. And he was like, yeah, thank you so much. So I gave that to him. Then I was like, hey, Glenn, are you into reading much? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I love reading. I said, oh, well, like 100 meters down the road, I just picked up this book, and it's, given, it's called Paths to Peace, and it's given me a lot of, a lot of, a lot of help through dark times. And so I'd, I'd love to leave this with you if you were keen. And, and Glenn goes, yeah, thanks, man. And then I said, oh, and by the way, like, I really, I, I find a lot of um, comfort in, in prayer. Would you mind if I prayed for you? And, and he's like, sure. And so there I was in what I thought were, like, semi-nice clothes, squatting on the street, praying with this guy. Then afterwards I left. And I just thought to myself, what if this could happen every week? What if every week I was open enough to the Spirit and willing enough to listen to God's lead in, in, leading in, in my life to be willing to step out of my comfort zone and do crazy, radical things to help make me, to humble me and make me a more nice person and ultimately to make the world a better place and to bring the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love down here to earth. And so I started this talk ask postulating what, what can we do to have maximum value? How can you make these 20 minutes mean something? I suggest the way, to, the, way, the way to have maximum value is maximum participation. Because church won't mean anything to us unless we let church change us. The gospel won't mean anything to us unless we let the gospel change our hearts. Jesus will be nothing more than a historical figure unless we let him change our hearts and change our lives. And why would we want to do that? Why would we want to change? I'd like to suggest that the single greatest reason as to why we should change or why would we, why would we want to change? Because Jesus changed for us. Jesus was there up in heaven 
I'll, just, I'll read a short passage to you. It's called, found in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians sort of near the end. Philippians 2 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, a bond servant, a slave, being made in human likeness. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even a death on a cross. See, friends, today we're looking up to a God who leads by example, a God who walks the talk, a God who is willing to deny everything in and of himself to change our lives, to change our hearts, and to offer us a way out and a way of salvation. Thank you.